it's a real privilege to introduce my friend and colleague and partner. Um, there's a wonderful theme. Have you felt it already? A theme of creativity here in the room. And uh, my wife likes to remind me as an artist that the first thing God had the ancient Israelites do after their redemption was a community art project called the Tabernacle. And so I want to thank you. Beauty matters. And urban missiologist Ray Bakke said the poor need beauty as well as bread. And that theme of creativity really helps introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Amos Young is the Dean of, uh, of the School of Mission and Theology and Professor of Theology and Mission at Fuller Seminary. But our relationship and friendship goes back to the 1980s. And uh, when he was graduating and headed toward graduate school and other new experiences, and I, and I was just beginning my, my career uh, in higher education, we intersected, and then we intersected again when he had gotten his PhD. But I want to bring you a couple things that he brings to the table as he's going to share with us about some of the dynamics of the future of theological education. He brings a global perspective, he brings an ecumenical perspective, and he brings a pneumatic perspective. He is a Pentecostal himself, but he's not speaking in behalf of a narrow part of global Christianity, but rather speaking about what life is like after Pentecost, since all of God's people have the Spirit, and the Spirit is at work in every Christian stream and tradition. So he's a friend, he's a colleague, he's a partner, and let's welcome Amos as he comes and shares with us tonight. Amos? Thank you, Charlie. Good evening, everybody. This changes things, right? All right. Okay. Um, well, um, I didn't plan on showing up here tonight with this, uh, my arm in a sling. So I should probably say one or two things about that, um, which is that I didn't plan on showing up this way. And it dawns on me now that I'm going to have to give up my um, my night job, you know, which I do in my sleep, which is throw 95 mile an hour fastballs because Apparently, I've got rotator tough cuff tendonitis um, that came about uh, at the end of last week. So here we are, and uh, I'll um, you know we'll attend to this. And like I said, I'm going to uh, quit my pitching job at night and just mo maybe focus more on theological education during the daytime, and, and maybe that'll that'll help things out. Um, but I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation, um, and we'll attempt to say a few things about thriving theological education in a networked world. Awesome, even better. Then I can do this without having to. Something like that, right? All right, um, I'm going to kind of move over here a little bit. Um, so much of my uh, what, much of my comments are going to be adapted from a book uh, I published a couple of years ago, "Renewing the Church by the Spirit: Theological Education After Pentecost." The three parts of the book include part one, church amid world Christianities, the heart and soul of theological education. When I when we think about how does theological formation thrive, I think one of the, one of the things we need to make sure we connect the dots to is connecting theological education, theological formation to how it serves the church. So we'll spend a little bit, a little bit of time uh, there in part one. Part two, witness in local context, the hands and works of theological transformation the missional dimension of what we do, the missional dimension with regard to what formation is for, how it serves the church, and how it serves, you know, um, God's coming reign, right? So uh, I won't spend as much time on part two in terms of the few moments I have with you this evening. Part three, the academy in local context, the mind and task of theological exploration, the work of the faculty, the work of the faculty as uh, educators, and the work of the faculty as those who uh, are, are also those who help help us, the church, think about what we do, right? So I'll, I'll spend more time on parts one and part three. Connecting, therefore, sort of, I, I guess the way I would try to answer that question would be, uh, when I think about what thriving in theological education entails, I think about uh, the, who, 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 who are we that are involved in theological education? That's the who question, the church, the, the role of uh, theological faculties or theological institutions in relationship to the church. What are we doing? That's the missional dimension of what we do, right? And how how plugged in are we to, uh, how aligned are we to uh, what in what we're doing with God's mission uh, to save the world? And then and then the hows of that, the the insides from the theological faculty side, curriculum, pedagogy, 
and then the research and scholarship that supports that mission and that addresses um, that mission as carried out by the church. So that's kind of an overview, I think, of, of where we're headed for the next few moments. And um, we'll see how we can connect some of the dots. When I also think about the heart and soul of theological education, we, we, we looked at the three parts, right? Heart and soul, um, hands and works, uh, mind and, and exploration, right? So heads, hands, and hearts. I mean, that's the sort of the pietistic tradition that forms me and, and many Pentecostals. But how do we make sure we connect the dots, close the loop between our heads, our hearts, our hands, what we do, how we feel, uh, and how we're thinking? In this particular context, thinking about church amidst world Christianities, I, I do think that yes, there's a there's a very uh, there's a great deal of locality to all we do in theological education, from places where we're located to cities where we serve to etc. Right, and and then there's also the fact that we we live in this very very dynamic, fluid, networked world context. So our specificities are are converging nexuses of movements, uh, developments, histories, and so on and so forth, right? So everything that we do in any spe spe specific space is always laced through with implications for what's beyond uh, the connecting points and so on and so forth. So asking the question about the church is both a very specific question, like this church, this space, this people, uh, in this locality, uh, and yet at the same time, this people in this locality is formed by movement, right? Relationships, networks, connections uh, that, that link this locality, this space with other localities, other spaces, and then global flows and those sorts of things. So um, thinking therefore in that respect, I also want to think not just phenomenologically about the church as the soul of theological education, but I want to think theologically as well. Um, and, and from that perspective, think in that respect, ask sort of the, the Trinitarian church question. How do we think about the church as the body of Christ? How do we think about the church as the people of God? How do we think about the church as the fellowship of the spirit? Hopefully that helps us to also get at some of the phenomenology, right? But we don't want to do the phenomenology only for the sake of the phenomenon, but we want to sort of think about the phenomenon with theological categories. So that's what I'm trying to do as well. If we're going to do theological education, then it needs to be also theologically informed, right? So again, connecting church theological understanding with the soul of theological education uh, uh, and, and the work of uh, thinking theologically about that. <clears throat> Starting in the Western context, in part because, I mean, that's where I'm located, and many of us are here. Uh, most Many of us probably work in, in Western contexts. Uh, and from that perspective, when I think about our particular context, Northern, North America, uh, what church, you know, what's the nature of the, the church? And of course, that's such a big question at one, at one level. I mean, the, the church ecumenical is, is in North America, right? With all of its pluralities and complexities. Um, but in every particular context, we try to get some handles, some something to make some connections, recognize it only gives us a slice into the reality, gives an opportunity to talk about this recognizing that whatever we might say about that particular slice is a slice, right? But that slice names an important dimension of what it, of this of this particular context. So I would say that that one of the important contexts about world Christianity and in particular also in the West right now, it's its evangelical character, it's evangelical history, it's evangelical plurality. Yes, the word evangelical has all kinds of yes, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Connotations, baggage, challenges. But yet the global character of, of I mean, the, 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 the global character of the church uh, in all of its diverse histories informed by this evangelical movement is plural. It's growing, right? So we, we can't just ignore that, right? It, it requires us to name it. And, and I think one of the ways we name it is also using theological language. Right? The evangel is the good news, the gospel. Uh, if we don't like the word evangelical, we still have to name that evangel, and all of the different ways in which all of our churches both live into that partially or very little at all or whatever we try. <laughs> I think we all want to say we try, right? How do we name this sort of evangelical, evangel-oriented church called by the gospel, but in many ways falling so far short? So let's just put it, sort of name that. Um, this how church that I'm thinking about is in North America in particular, it's what I would, how I would frame 
the question of, you know, what's after denominationalism, which is not to say that denominationalism is completely gone. It's still around. There's still plenty of that here around us, right? Um, but it's the question of what's coming, what's coming alongside, what's emerging underneath, alongside, around denominations. And I think the word there is what I would call networks. Networks are fluid. They're, they're relational. They are dynamic. They are uh, occasional, right? They're contextual. Uh, networks come and go because relationships get established. The relationships serve certain purposes for certain periods of time. And then once a network no longer serves particular purpose, particular context, you switch. You form new associations. That's the very, very fluid landscape of what church is, I think, in a sort of late post-denominational context, right? Where where denominations provided for decades or centuries even uh, certain structural frames through which congregations would relate to one another and relate to how they saw themselves carrying out um, God's mission in the world. Now, in this in this particular time, I think I would say networks is a is a very it's a way to think about the changing nature of ecclesial sort of structures, forms, uh, 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 morphing sort of characteristics, so to speak. And then I would also add that uh, again in North America now, you know, the the charismatic renewal sixties, seventies. I think many of us um, experience it, uh, were informed by and carry that. Through and, and in many respects, we now live in a a post charismatic not post in the sense of having left it behind, but but having a charismatic renewal really really begun to incorp be incorporated into a large swath of all churches, right? Denominational churches, uh, you know, uh, and so there's just what I would call this charisma charismatizing dimension of the church, which is in some respects a return to first principles that the church was never really not supposed to be non-charismatic. But it's also in another set of respects, a, a I think, a um, an ongoing discovery of what, what that means, how it looks like, uh, the, the journey that it invites us upon once we attend to, recognize, and then welcome that dimension of our, of our journey as the church, right? Uh, which then involves all the questions about uh, how does this get discerned? How does this get uh, managed, so to speak? How does this, how, how do we allow this to really lead us in this journey of, of surprise um, anticipation? So, so I would say that um, it's, it's sort of the, 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 the very moments in which we recognize the limits of, of institutions and structures, we begin to open up ourselves to say, what is, what is God doing in the world? How do we keep adapting to that? We adapt to that. We develop new institutions, structures. We figure out, well, those instructions, they work for a little bit. Now we got to re redo ourselves, right? That's, I think, that, that ongoing charismatic dimension. So these are the ways that I think in which, um, when I think about the phenomenon of church in the Western context today, invite us to think about theological education amidst these kinds of developments, right? Well, then... Even stepping out from that or uh, broadening sort of the, the, the scope and the lens, um, what about the church Catholic? And I want to now also think about, again, the Western church is, we think about the church in the West itself, is, is very, very plural, very, very diverse. We don't need to go elsewhere to get that diversity, right? But let's just name also the fact that, that when we go elsewhere, we do then experience that diversity differently, right? And so in this global ecclesial church Catholic universal context, we have to reckon with that, with that uh, uh, plurality of plurality, so to speak. And certainly one way in which we can think about that is how some of this language of the Browning of the North American church invites us to think about North America now in relationships to, in relationship to not North America or Central America or uh, South America, or in some of the uh, conversations about the browning of the North American church, it's not just about uh, Latin America and South America, but it's about the Asianization, the Africanization, the Latin Americanization of the church, even in North America, right? So again, these are global flows. 
migration after 1965, an ongoing reality in which we're, we're navigating. We're navigating that here in North America. And of course, the rest of the world has been for the last 200 years, been navigating when North Americans and Europeans went there and that and initiated their own processes of, of uh, what church meant in those contexts. Now also, I think we're in a context within which we're grappling with what does it mean? What does it mean for us to have had provided leadership for theological education for a couple hundred years? And now the center of gravity is shifting so that we now know there are more Christians in Asia, Africa, Latin America than there are in North America. How does that shift of the center of gravity sort of realign what providing theological leadership means? Uh, there are all kinds of ways in which those questions are being asked. Um, there's a certain reality still to the fact that um, Asia, Africa, Latin America has been sending their students to North America or to Europe for the theological formation and theological education. Increasingly, that's, I think, changing. Uh, more and more theological institutions in Asia, Africa, Latin America are developing uh, higher and higher levels of theological formational uh, programs and opportunities. And we could now almost say something like education is not happening from everywhere to everywhere, right? You don't need to necessarily go somewhere. You, Wherever you're at, you may have access to theological education in that particular space. That access to that theological education in that particular space may be a digital access, or it may be a very, very concrete local access, right? Um, and so the flows of theological education, theological leadership, I think, are moving in many, many directions. There's as much opportunity, I think, today for us to learn from our Asian, African, and Latin American brothers and sisters doing theological education in their context for us as they have been learning from us historically. So the learning, I think, is a much more mutual, dialogical, and, and multidirectional kind of um, adaptation. Um, yeah, when I thank you, Charlie, for, you know, uh, mentioning the part, uh, you know, I grew up in the Sunday's of God, uh, maintained credentials with them, the four, the church, the four square church. When I talk though about the Pentecostalizing of theological education, I'm referring not only to the fact that Pentecostal denominations and movements and networks have now increasingly also been developing their own institutions of theological education, uh, not only in North America, but also around the world. But also about the fact, I think we also realize, right, that that many um, uh, institutions of theological education, movements of theological education and formation have been emerging around the world that are developed by folks who are late, post, or after Pentecostals, or folks who um, may be informed by those churches, but not necessarily only understand themselves as serving those churches, right? So in other words, uh, programs of study, uh, occasions of engaging with these sorts of issues that are informed and shaped by Pentecostal experience. But Pentecostal experience, not just as owned by denominations or churches, but uh, Pentecostal experience as, if you will, delineate, described, invited to by the New Testament, the day of Pentecost, and what the day of Pentecost unfolded and invited uh, the people of God into, right? So there's ways to think about the Pentecostal dimension, which is consistent with thinking about it uh, in terms of the charismatizing of the church um, as uh, the uh, calling attention to the work of the spirit that is not copyrighted by only certain groups of people, but that the scriptures and the evangel actually invite a more fully, a, full, a more full inhabitation of, right? a more full uh, experience of and an openness to what the spirit is doing. And so in, in that respect, I think Pentecostals, or at least in the churches that were, well, I mean, again, evangelicals sent missionaries to the ends of the earth too. Pentecostals weren't the only ones, right? Um, but I'm particularly uh, connecting to uh, Acts 1.8, where it talks about, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, so starting in Jerusalem and into Judea, into Samaria, and into the ends of the earth, right? So Thinking about, th there's of course some, some challenges there about how we then think through, engage with others across borders, all kinds of borders, 
the degree to which we're exporting, the degree to which we're exchanging, the degree to which we're dialoguing, learning from one another, right? Um, and, and really having that, that mutuality, I think, is important. When I think then of the church as a fellowship of the spirit, we're still in this moment here of thinking about the soul of theological education. What's the nature of the church look like, feel like in, in the 2020s, right? Um, when I think about the church as a fellowship of the spirit, I'm particularly calling attention to church forms and expressions that are pneumatically oriented, charismatically oriented, much less sacramentally oriented, and which is not to say that pneumatic and charismatic churches don't have sacramental proclivities, but I think that a sacramental kind of uh, performative uh, imaginative sensibility would locate a, a certain, you know, identify institutional kinds of frames as, as important as the more loose, organic, relational kinds of frames that, that I think the fellowship of the spirit metaphors uh, invite us to think about, right? So, when you think about this fellowship, relational, organic dimension of the church, then you think about, I think, some of these things that I put up here. Nuns, multiple religious belongers, insider movements, Jesus followers in the 2020s that aren't necessarily Jesus followers because they belong to a certain group or organization or denomination or what have you that had you sign up somewhere, right? But, but these are emerging grassroots sort of organic, very, very fluid sort of things. and controversial in their own ways, right? But but we can't deny that there, there is this Jesus-following dimension that begs for theological consideration, theological engagement, theological discernment, theological formation. And how do we, how do, we do all that within this very, very fluid space? Um, millennials, Gen Zers, digital culture, spiritualities, and religiosities in the network 21st century, um, you know, coffee shop churches, um, you know, um, uh, workout club, you know, uh, groups that meet for Bible studies, right? All of this is happening. We, we know that they're happening. Uh, we know they're happening alongside our churches that, that meet in buildings. We know they're happening in all kinds of uh, very, very fluid spaces. Uh, we know that because our kids are involved in a lot of these things, right? So these are the realities of the way church is evolving at this point in time. And I think that fellowship of the spirit sort of notions also invite us to think about how, yeah, you know, within within sort of an institutional denominational matrix, it's more easy to say, here's where the boundaries of the church are, or here's where there's the us and there's where the they are. Fellowship of the spirit ways of thinking about ecclesia make those borders a little bit more difficult to clearly demarcate, right? So like where church starts and stops and where world starts and stops is a bit more fuzzier. Invites again, that kind of theological educational endeavor that is able to at least attend to that fuzziness, not necessarily solve that fuzziness, but, but work through that fuzziness in, in all the ways that that fuzziness might need to be worked through. Um, but yet at the same time, again, being, being attentive to how this is just again, some of the hooks, right? We connected to the other hooks in the previous couple of slides. And so we've got lots going on as we think about the soul of theological education, I think, the nature of what, how the church is morphing and transforming, and then all the opportunities and challenges that that presents to us that are theological education educators in our space. Um, most of what I'm saying, I think, um, have to address uh, those of us who work in theological educational spaces that are more seminary contexts. I'm, I'm thinking less about, um, you know, graduate school programs in, in universities, uh, contexts where it's not that they don't do theological education, but they don't necessarily have the church as the frame in and through which their theological education has been carried out, right? So again, I'm thinking about seminary contexts seminary context that serve, uh, that form people for the church, for the purposes of the mission of God, and how do we close that loop properly? This leads, of course, to, I think, like, I think I always say that this missional dimension of theological education, which is the missional dimension of the church as well, understanding who the church is, understanding what the church's mission is, understanding how the church may be called to participate in God's mission in the world today. Love hearing about the kind of the design stuff that we're doing, right? I mean, so... How do we how do how do we even understand how that work is missional? 
like the way in which we heard being talked about a few moments ago, right? That now can inform how the church lives out into the mission of God in the world in things like design companies that we've heard about uh, in our before us. And so this missional dimension, I think, is, is really crucial. It really opens up, I think, all kinds of spaces because, again, just like Fellowship of the Spirit opens up new ways of thinking about church and world, us and them, this missional dimension also invites us to new ways of thinking about how we, whoever we think we are as the people of God, are attempting to live out the mission of God in the world with them, right? Whoever we think they are <laughs> that's in the world. Then the we and the they now all of a sudden, you know, are, are us, us trying to figure out how to design uh, a building for a particular kind of experience that allows for thriving, right? Um, you're doing it from a very specific Christian set of commitments, but a lot of people that you're working with may not have those same commitments, but you might have some same and similar miss missional objectives. How do we think through the church's mission in that particular context so that our theological education formation can be uh, can serve some many of those missional purposes that are maybe uh, less traditioned ways of thinking missiologically, but uh, no less for that reason, still deeply missiological. So those are the kinds of ways in which we need to keep thinking about ecclesia and mission that I think are important. Uh, and I'm now going to move on. I don't spend too much. I'm not going to spend too much more time uh, here talking about this, but you can pick up my book and, and read about that part of it as well if you want to hear more about that. I'm going to spend now the last, uh, I don't have a time here. What, how, what time do we have? 25, great. Okay, I'll try to wrap up in about five minutes or so to give time for respondents. But um, so then thinking about then the thriving of those who do the work of theological ed education, in particular thinking about uh, the work of the faculty. And uh, got one of our faculty at Fuller Seminary, M Michaela, good, good to see you. Um, now, you know, to what degree is all of this enacted at Fuller Seminary? I'm not going to say, but you can ask her about that, and then she'll give you the real truth about what's really going on there, okay? Um, but yeah, we, we, we develop curriculum, right? We teach, and, and usually most of us are formed through some kind of program of study that, that helps us to think theologically, and that's a journey, right? I, I think we, we all see through a glass dimly, so the journey is a lifetime journey to keep thinking theologically, to to um, uh, to follow uh, the spirits leading into truth. Oops, let me see. Yeah, teaching, learning, and 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 scholarship. Um, the way in which then I would want to highlight, I think, how theological education uh, can be most healthy would be to say then that the. And when I say it, uh, yeah, the the approach, the method that we might be most helped by has two dimensions to it that are what I would call what I would call ecclesial and missiological. And these relate to everything that I just talked about before, right? Meaning that this is what I would call the hermeneutical or methodological dimension of what we do as as uh, educators in terms of our curriculum. Why do I call this the hermeneutical and the missiological? Because I I I can I would like to invite you to think about them as sort of like the two lenses of how we put our curriculum together. The curriculum ought to serve if you will, forming of people for membership, participation, performance in the body of Christ, in the fellowship of the spirit, right? And it ought to form them for that participation to live into the mission of God. So, so if, if whatever we're doing doesn't have or, or is short on this ecclesial and missional side, then we're not going to be forming students. We're not going to be forming Right, uh, uh, we're not. Our theological formation isn't going to be by and for the church, nor is it going to be by and for God's mission. Okay, so those are the ways in which I would want us to think about church and mission as two kind of pretty overarching and fundamental methodological, hermeneutical sort of frames that invite us to think about all that we do in this space as who's the church, what is it supposed, what is God calling it to do and be. And how does all that participate in and serve God's mission in the world? Right, all those those questions need to be asked at every at every turn in my mind. At, that helps us to keep recalibrating what we're doing in this theological formational space. 
Um, the last part, though, and this part is the, an important part as well, right? So you get these two lenses of, you know, missional and, and e ecclesial. But yet at the same time, every one of us in, in the faculty and, and every one of us elsewhere, even if we're not fa in faculties, we have certain expertise, certain, certain uh, disciplines or certain areas of, of training, right, that 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 uh, through which we are called to live out God's um, mission in the world. Design, in your case, right? Environmental understanding. I mean, that's, a co I mean, you got a PhD that probably takes twice as long as a PhD in theology. And it takes a long time to get a PhD in theology. So, right. Uh, but the point is that um, faculties or those of us who work in theological education, we might be shaped and formed in any number of disciplines. Every one of those disciplines are important. They provide different angles in the world. They provide different angles on, on, on the creation, perspectives, right? Every one of them can be adapted to or, 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 or invited to serve the ecclesial and missional purposes of theological education. And every one of them should, right? So that there are no disciplines that are off, off bounds here as we think about the God's call to the church to live out its mission for the whole world uh, with all the challenges that we have. These challenges are economic, they're health, they're political, they're social, they're environmental, cultural, racial, right? All these invite different disciplinary expertise, perspectives, um, the sciences, culture, uh, economics, Right? And so the, the, the invitation is for theological education to enter into these conversations, to bring these conversations into our work, and to, and, to, and to do this work dialogically then for the purposes of our students, for the sake of the church, and for God's purposes in the world. Pedagogy. Um, again, fluidness, network, uh, flatten, non-hierarchical much more mutual, much more dynamic language of constructivist and uh, uh, constructivist language, I think is a lot of it is in, in digital online education. But I think this, what we're learning in these online spaces is what actually mirrors what we all really feel like a flattening of the world invites us to live differently, right? Hold our hierarchies much more loosely. Hold our, um, our binaries much more loosely, right? Um, Every one of us are nodes of, of very, very uh, active transactions. And, and all, all of that convergence means that we're all responding in multiple directions all the time. So the pedagogical uh, space then that theological education, I think, invites is this very, very dynamic space in which, again, Faculty learn as much from students at one level as students are expected to learn from faculty. That's the character now of this relational, ongoing, dialogical, flat, networked reality that we're invited to posture ourselves differently, right? It's not even so much so that, um, again, um, I think one of the ways in which we would think about it would be to say that we're now often more facilitators of discovery, right, than we are those that... that um, you know, yeah, you know, I think there was some nods. So you follow what I'm saying here. Um, experiences of the spirit are are inclusive and also invite us to think about embodied learning. I think that's also true in digital education. I think the power of digital education is allowance of access to information potentially that you didn't have access to before. But where digital education can really live into its promise is if it enables the learner, the student, to in real time um, test out, connect what they're learning in digital spaces with real life experiences, right? Prior generations of theological formation would have said, okay, we're going to go off and move to another town. We're going to study for three years or four years at the seminary, and then we're going to graduate, and then we're going to go on to go to ministry. Well, the digital space today, people are in ministry full-time, and they're only doing their theological education part-time, right? And so the contextual embodied character of learning is in the missional and ministry space, 
And the theological formational uh, experience is only as powerful as it allows for testing of and, um, yeah, living out, if you will, uh, what is learned in these missional ecclesial uh, spaces in the world. And so, I, think it's, it's, so I, I would say that, that online education invites us to think about theological incarnation and education in new ways, or, or the incarnational dimension of theological education in new ways. And then diverse communities of learning, um, inviting, again, this what I call this performative dimension. We don't have to wait until after we graduate to perform, to, to live into a, the missional task. We're already trying to live into the missional task to the best of our ability, even without the theological education, right? That's how the world is structured these days. And if I can get a little bit of theological education along the way, then thank you, Jesus. Maybe I'll do it a little bit better. Uh, and if I can't access theological education, I'm still going to be carrying out what I believe is living into God's call in my life, wherever that is, right? And so, um, and and in that respect, I think that it does help us to close the loop between theory and practice a lot better if we've attended to it and made sure that we found ways to to do that in the way in which we construct and then in the way in which we teach. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I want to keep inviting all of us as, you know, I, I was trained in religious studies and in theology, and my own work has led me to ongoing conversations about, you know, learning from different disciplinary perspectives to inform my work as a theologian. Um, as we keep asking more and more challenging questions about the complex realities of the world in which we live in, I keep having to look for more and more resources, right? Um, beyond the guild that I was formed and shaped in and, and having those further and further conversations. And so I think all of us uh, gain from and then uh, can value uh, greater and greater networks of partnerships uh, that bring scholars and researchers and teachers and professors and administrators together with uh, different training, background, expertise, um, and the various uh, configurations of how all those work out will produce those rich set of experiences uh, for those students in whatever context within which that happens. And, and again, from a seminary perspective, how do we continue to find ways to take the research and the scholarship that we're doing and translate it for in ways that are much more accessible to churches. Uh, I think we're getting better and better at it. Michaela, you, the work that we're doing, you guys are doing on the equipped side of Fuller. I think there's a lot of that. And I, I'm, I'm uh, really excited about ways in which we can continue to, to live further into that. The promise of the scholar, the theological scholarship, can uh, we, we still need to really maximize the potential of what that uh, is able to uh, do for the church, I think. And so... Uh, continue to find ways to do that. And the last thing I'll then say would be many tongues, many peers, many referees. Um, yeah, there's, you know, obviously peer review for tr more traditional ways of thinking about how scholarship breaks new ground in advancing knowledge in certain guilds and in certain disciplinary areas, and all that will continue in its own spaces. But there's all kinds of other ways in which as we uh, translate our our, you know, our, our research uh, for broader uh, access and distribution, all kinds of other ways in which I think we are in the, there's a, in, in many ways, I think we all know there's much more information available today than ever before. None of us can keep up with all of that. That's what's been produced, right? But yet at the same time, there's certain ways in which even putting something up in a blog or uh, putting something up uh, on any particular web space will bring about its own set of reactions, responses, interactions, reviews, if you will, right? How do we therefore then continue to find ways, this is both a missional question and an ecclesial question. It's an ecclesial question about how to continue to navigate identity. Who is a church? What is church called to be at a particular time and space? And what's the mission of the church in these times and spaces? All of that, I think, is part of what bearing witness entails. 
and that very witness entails translating scholarship into uh, uh, miss, missional missional witness, you know, to bear witness to the evangel in this particular space, that particular space, this particular time. So the invitation is always, therefore, you know, research is never done. And translation of research is also never done. I mean, that's the, the character of Pentecost that calls us to, to attend to the different ways in which the Spirit uh, takes the wondrous works of God and makes it known in new languages and new contexts, new perspectives. I'll stop there. And uh, I could invite the panelists to join me who are going to be discussion partners. And Amos, please come on up. I think we have room for you also up here. Those great questions. Testing. Okay, there we go. Oh, well, go ahead. Lisa, come on in. Philip. Yeah, I think we've got one, two, three. Bring your chair. Bring your chair. All right, we got room for you right here. Great. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I'd love about two more hours, wouldn't you? Just to both enjoy, enjoy our brother, but also uh, discuss with him. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get each of our panelists to um, both, I want you to introduce yourself, what's, what space and place you're in, but also respond to the underlying theme or themes that you picked up from Amos and its contextualization in, in both in serving the church and the world. So let me start with, with you, my brother on the end. And just introduce yourself, and then I'd like you just to respond to what you heard from Dr. Young, and then we'll ask some questions of each other. Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah, it we'll is. Okay. Yeah. I feel like something now. Um, and, and this is where we give our prepared uh, responses to... Yeah, exactly. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, my name is Philip Thompson, and I teach theology and church history at Kairos University, Sioux Falls Seminary. Uh, sort of an odd uh, and a brand new kind of configuration of theological You're part of schools. this flattening world. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, I I think um, there there's a title of a really good book on the uh, the liturgical year and consumerism by Scott Wolkes, a political scientist, called "The Fullness of Time in a Flat World." And and I think you know, we, we what Amos sketches and and what we're living. Uh, there is this kind of fullness of time in the midst of a flat world. So I teach, uh, as I said, uh, theology and church history. And I, um, I read Amos's book. So my comments are, um, are, are as much from the book as from the presentation. And there's, there's one thing I'll mention that is probably more focused on the book than what Amos shared tonight. Uh, but I hope that will encourage everyone to get the book and read it because it is uh, it deserves several careful and uh, meditative readings. And so I do thank Amos for the, for the book and for the presentation. I find it encouraging that the ideas and vision Amos has set forth resonate deeply with those taking concrete shape in the practice and experience of Kairos University. I want briefly to note a particular resonance between Amos's vision and our embodiment of theological education one place where I think we may think, um, uh, we may consider one theological idea a little bit differently, yet in a way that can inform the categories that Amos has developed. And then I'll share a very little about some important uh, parts of our practice that I think would add to Amos's vision. Uh, the particular resonance is that in the praxis reflection that has driven Kairos from its start, and it started in 2014, so we're, we're in our ninth year of it now. Our thought is, has turned more and more toward pneumatological categories. Um, in our Kairos blog, we are two posts into a series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, the series bears the playful title, A Wild Goose Chase, reflecting the less tame Celtic avian image for the third person than the tamer dove image that we often find. Uh, the title also importantly reflects a sense not of waiting for the Spirit, but trusting that the Spirit is at work. And so we seek signs of the Spirit and follow the Spirit, the power of the new age, going forth to bring, for, bring all things into God's 
intended redemption. For some time, I've uh, commented that the informal Kairos hymn should be a hymn that's found in many 19th century Baptist hymnals that begins, "'Tis God the Spirit leads in paths before unknown. The work to be performed is ours, the strength, the Spirit's own." A place where I think we differ slightly is on page 61 of Amos's book, so that will give you a point to the specificity there, <laughs> um, in which he rightly connects the incarnational aspect of theological education with what he calls, uh, quote, interpersonal materiality, end quote. Now, while I don't want to make this sound more like a response that's more proper to ETS than Karam Forum, I want to suggest that while this is not at all wrong, it may miss an important dimension of incarnation for church and theological education that's certainly implicit throughout Amos's entire argument, yet it needs to be made explicit, and it also needs to be extended in a direction that I don't think Amos does pursue, which is that of institutional identity and philosophy. I'd like to share a, a lengthy quote from, uh, well, not that lengthy, but Adoniram Judson Gordon's The Ministry of the Holy Spirit. He wrote it in 1894. Um, he wrote, quote, the church is formed within, from within, Christ present by the Holy Ghost, regenerating men by the sovereign action of the Spirit and organizing them into himself as the living center. The head and the body are therefore one and predestined to the same history of humiliation and glory. If the church will literally manifest Christ, then she must be both a living and a dying church. To this she is committed in the divinely given form of her baptism. The dying of the Lord and his members is to be constantly affected by the indwelling spirit. The church, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all, completes in the world his crucifixion as well as his resurrection. Thus the church is called to live a glorified life in communion with her head, and a crucified life in her contact with the world. We hear in these lines the Spirit's work taking shape in the kenosis of the incarnation, work that leads not simply to a hospitable and egalitarian flattening, though these are among the Spirit's fruit discerned in these latter days, but to a radical divestment of power. Thus, to share in the incarnate ministry of the one of whom Basil of Caesarea said the Holy Spirit was an inseparable companion, is to be led into this divestment, into the way of the cross. This enables us, if I might use Luther's words from the Heidelberg Disputation, to call a thing what it is. This is not easy. In last week's Kairos blog uh, post, uh, it was written, quote, when the Spirit says, I am doing this new thing, but you need to give away your power and influence to join me, we don't jump right up and say, sign me up. But in Kairos, we are called to the Spirit-led, cruciform divestment. So I'll notice a few ways in which we've lived into that. First, in order to address the crisis of student debt and the affordability of theological education, we adopted a new tuition schedule at a time when we knew it would mean a half million dollars of lost revenue. We now charge our students $300 a month. Um, some in, thir in the uh, majority world pay less than that, and we're still working to lower it because it's still an obstacle. Second, we've shifted our approach from what Amos describes as an institutionalized ecclesiocentric equipping model to one of discipleship and formation for vocational flourishing for the sake of the world. As our president, Greg Henson, has said, quote, if you start with discipleship, you can award degrees, but if you start with degrees, you may not get discipleship. Third, we have asked what is required for radical adjustment of institutional thinking about what we do. What separates us from other schools, we believe, is our reimagination of the structures of governance. What does it mean to be an institution of higher education? Outcomes, competencies, contexts, etc., are talked about by others, but they've not taken root as much in other schools because other schools have not wrestled with the necessary organizational philosophy to allow the proper concepts to flourish. Changes get mired in bureaucracy. In particular, we have to be willing to divest, to give away authority precisely in those areas where most schools seek to hold on to it. We give away our, part, our power externally to our partners 
and also internally through the practice of what we call trust-based collaborative governance. This is not just another word for shared governance. Shared governance tends to imply ownership of parts and pieces, and I'll share my part with you until I don't like the way you use it, then I'm going to ask for it back. For example, curriculum assessment, program development, standards of excellence, these include voices other than just the faculty, though the faculty do have a voice and perhaps may be a first voice among equals here. But this puts us in a vulnerable position. We also seek to practice theological hospitality, something other schools are discussing, yet not many are making it so central an idea as we are. Greg Henson says it's because we're Baptist. Orthodoxy, he says, is often articulated in a Constantinian mode. I can't effectively rule an empire that doesn't have uniformity. We lose in this the ability to be in communication with each other, which is something that Amos developed so beautifully. So we seek at Kairos, we seek the mind of Christ through discerning conversation in which every voice is heard and light is received from all directions. Thanks. Thank you. There's a lot to digest, and let's just, just jump right to Lisa. And oh boy, uh, I don't know how to follow that. Well, what, the, what he said. How's yeah, that? <laughs> the, the fun thing is, Amen. is your unique vocation is complimentary. Well, um, so I never quite know, Greg Forrester, how I end up on panels at Karam Forum. Um, I am neither a theological educator nor a pastor. Um, I am, yeah. Um, and I am downstream in many cases from theological education. I work in the marketplace as a consultant um, and, and uh, I do a lot of organizational development work, but sort of my unique niche um, is, is around voc deep vocational stewardship and discipleship work. And that has led me to work with quite a number of pastors over the years because pastors are disintegrating all the time um, in heartbreaking ways. And they might be theologically educated, but they, to your point, have not been discipled. And I feel like I've said that before on panels at Karam Forum, but uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Um, to me, it is the big missing piece of theological education. Um, and, and we want, I, I come out of sort of the faith and work world and have spent a lot of time, led an organization in Pittsburgh for 15 years. Um, and know many of the folks in this room and, and others here because I do some work with the Denver Institute. So I'm thrilled to, to be part of that Reading the CityGate initiative. All of that matters to me as a practitioner. Um, but if we want the church to take up its role as the church in discipling people for all of life, then we have to do a better job with our pastors. Hmm. And they need to be able to live in not just to the, the call of the, the office of pastor, but their unique way of inhabiting that role. Um, and the pastors that I work with, uh, many of them come because they can't inhabit the role as it's been defined. So they can't meet anybody's expectations. And they're getting their butts kicked every day, to put it bluntly. Um, and, and they don't want to stay in ministry anymore. Right, because it's too painful. They 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 feel like a failure on every front, and it's you know we're going to hear from Fernando here, who probably speaks for the voice of of pastors in many ways. Um, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, that said, there's hope, um, and and I I want to give you one little mini case study uh, with a, a pastor that I've been working with for the last couple of years. Um, he came to me about six months into the pandemic. Uh, through a friend. Um, he's been pastoring for 20 years. He's a, been a church planter, um, pastors of a, a, a relatively healthy mid, what we would call mid-sized congregation in North Carolina, probably 500 or so folks. Um, although who knows in the pandemic world what that number actually is. And he was exhausted and burned out, not just because of the stresses of the pandemic or the fact that every issue he brought up in his church was being polarized about masks and vaccines and all the things that pastors have been burnt out about, but because he felt like he was constantly disappointing everyone in his church. And he said, I can't live into this anymore. And so I spent six months with him. Part of it was during a sabbatical, um, really understanding who he was, how God had uniquely made him, and how he could bring that to the role. 
And then we came back from his sabbatical a year ago in September, and I flew down to North Carolina to spend a day with his elders. Um, and that probably gives away a little bit of his denominational background. And he, he presented, here's who I am, and here's how I can bring my best to the church. And, but that means we need to do some things differently going forward. Um, about a year later, uh, and I, we've, I've been working with this church now and their elders for over a year, the elders finally at a September retreat this year woke up and realized, oh, if we really want to keep this man as our pastor, we have to restructure everything because he can't live into this role definition that we have. He has to be able to be who he is in that role. And who he is actually is a rabbi. But he's not an administrator, right? And he's a great discipler in his own, in his own denominational. He's looked to as a rabbi, but he hasn't been freed to do that. So now his elders are restructuring everything in the church. But this is not common. This is an uncommon thing, right? We're bumping up against all the institutional barriers you can imagine that come from a highly structured polity. Um, and they are, to their credit, taking them on, but right, to, to say to the presbytery, we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it that way. Still living within the confines of some of the institutional governance, but it's a very complicated thing, right? And, and so, you know, as we look at theological education and where it's going, and as I listen, um, uh, Amos, to your, to your talk, I think, you know, this idea that we have to be able to um, allow practitioners, people out in the field doing the ministry to be theologically educated kind of real time in an integrated way so that they can be doing experiments in the field that become reproducible in other ways rather than go to seminary, get your seminary education, and then go be a pastor. Um, it, it doesn't work. I don't think it works anymore. And so I think we have to reshape and reform. And that's what I, I heard in your comments very clearly. And that's very exciting. And I think you have a vision for that as well. And so I'm encouraged. And it feels like a big boulder. We're pushing up a very, here in Denver, we're in the mountains. Which direction am I looking in? You know, we've got a boulder to push up, up a hill. But I am, my heart breaks for pastors right now. And, and I think that when I think about theological education, they're, they're the output of theological education and we have to do better. Thank you. And do, you all, do you see the thread and the theme here? Um, it's just astounding to see the spirit at work. Can I quote Amos before Fernando comes? Um, Amos, one of your most impactful statements came from a Bible study you did in a Presbyterian church on the book of Acts. And one of the statements Amos made in that Bible study is, when the Holy Spirit is present, there's a new sociology. And I have been... I said that? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, I, I'm now claiming it. <laughs> All right, Fernando, would you, would you come and bring your response and your reflections? And uh, when Fernando's done, we're going to take a moment and just have a couple of questions but we're, not, we're also going to let you go close to on time so you'll come back in the morning refreshed. So just so you know ahead of time. Fernando, jump in. Sure. Thank you. My name is Fernando Tamara, uh, and uh, I'm a pastor, I'm a practitioner, and I'm a professor as well. So I'm a guest lecturer at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, and uh, the Lord enabled me to uh, design a non-degree certificate program on faith, work, and economic wisdom. Uh, a few years ago. And um, so far, we've graduated 14 students. This year, we're planning to graduate probably 25, 30 students. Uh, the amazing things that God is doing in our Pentecostal college is, is making me feel that God is still at work. And when I say this, it might sound some, you know, kind of uh, like a cliche, but I got to tell you something. Uh, Amos Young, I'm here and I'm listening and I was listening and, and I was just thinking, ah, man, someone needs to validate some things that he said, because uh, he talks about the importance of this, um, you know, the presence of the spirit. And as a pastor and as a, I consider myself a, a mini theologian who has come from a 
very rich Pentecostal tradition. My grandfather was one of those, um, if I can say, followers from an Azusa Street, Azusa Street, uh, um, a um, missionary who went to Lima, Peru. So I'm, I'm originally from Lima, Peru. And uh, my grandfather told me many stories, but I think when I when I think about the Hispanic church, the Pentecostal Hispanic church, two stories come into my mind. I want to share with you right now. Back in 1998, I was I was studying. Uh, I was taking a class on theology. I remember a private Pentecostal university. I'm now I'm not going to mention the name of the of the institution, but I was there and I was rediscovering a Greek text. The professor was encouraging us to study and get all of the resources we could. And I remember it was so moving to me at that moment that I, in class, I started weeping and I did not want it to make any noise. And I could not hold it. And it's very emotional when I share this story. My professor called me out in a class and he said, these he said this question, he asked me, he said, by the way, are you feeling good, Fernando? Would you like to go to the restroom? And I quietly uh, took a few seconds to digest that question. And here I was, a former past, I mean, a, a, a pastor, future pastor, someone who wanted to study the words of Jesus Christ, someone who was willing to be enriched by the Holy Scriptures, the written work of the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking, so am I coming to this place just, just to learn about this cognitive experience? How about the affective? How about the emotions? How about the responses? You know, how about my personal response and my reaction when I see this word vividly in my in my life? You know, how this word is penetrating my life. So I was completely, I felt miserable. Then I felt like, what am I doing here? If I'm coming to this uh, school is to learn the Bible. But at the same time, I want the Holy Spirit to train me as well and to search my heart and my soul. And this is something that, uh, um, uh, you know, has led me throughout the years to just to investigate, do some research about um, how in recent years, I've, I've, I've seen that there is a quite a separation between uh, the technicalities of uh, uh, the theological education in colleges and universities, and they're more eager to train people in the word of God, but sometimes they're not prepared to respond when someone has been the recipient of this powerful touch of God. So that's the first one. The second, the second one is that the second uh, example is I was um, having a class, I was teaching a class on theology of work. And that happened this year, early this year. And one of the students of the certificate program at AGTS uh, had the same experience, you know, started weeping in class. And uh, I, I realized then, I, I realized at that moment that I, that person was me 25, 23 years ago. So then I said, uh, can you tell us, can you share what you're feeling and tell us please more about what's happening in your heart? When I opened it up, somebody else started sharing and another person said, I don't know, but I feel the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We all were touched and we were crying and weeping together via Zoom. That was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. Uh, I've realized that the students in our classes uh, have vividly experienced and a more charismatic and experiential understanding of their own anthropology. And what I mean is that the students in our classes, as Hispanic students, future and potential prospects of theological studies, they come and as they learn theology, they get immersed in this ontological quest of who they really are as Pentecostals. So when you let, one, one of the things that I always tell them, if you feel that you have to interrupt me, if you see that you have to interrupt me in class, do it. 
you know, because I'm here just to, as a tutor, as a pedagogos, you know, I'm here just a tutor to lead you, to guide you, but I'm not here in charge. So I just wanted to comment on those two. And finally, I just wanted to make it very clear that in our Hispanic community, um, Amos Young talked about uh, two words, Easter and Pentecost, and he uses those interchangeably when he talks about uh, um, uh, these uh, pneumatological, you know, viewpoint in theology. But one of the things that I wanted to mention is that our, our people, our Hispanic people, um, find themselves with the, not with the recent Christ, but they associate themselves with the drama and the cross. Mm -hmm. it, that's, that's the people who we are. We are always seeing Jesus Christ actively giving his life for us. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we lived out our Christianity so normally outside. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we, as Hispanics as we are, we always, you know, find ways of witnessing Christ easily. And some people, I've heard many friends who just tell me, hey, Fernando, what do you think about the Hispanic theology here and there? Uh, I can mention a lot of friends who are Hispanic theologians, but I, I just want to finish with this. Um, I believe that there is this uh, uh, crucicentric, right? That's the word that Amos Young is using, crucicentric community. And the more we understand what kind of community we are, the more we will uh, understand our theology. Can we thank our panelists for their wisdom? Wow. Um, two things we're going to do. I'm going to ask Amos one question that's a combination of the two questions that you've submitted. And then when he's finished answering that question, Greg, may I close this out? Right. Oh, okay. So be, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll have, um, when Amos is done, I'd like us just to take a brief pause and allow the spirit to help us digest for a few seconds together. And then Greg will formally end the evening. And then the meeting in the parking lot is where the meeting will really start, right? Anyway, um, but Amos, I think it'd be really great in light of the feedback here. There's also some great feedback from our uh, participants here. What are some global theologians um, that can speak into this vision of flourishing? And if you could just maybe even just name one or two that some of us could write down that could speak into this holistic vision that you've been sharing. And then, and then related to that, do you think theological education is leading or following the direction of the church? And I thought that was an interesting, I, I like the juxtaposition of that. So are there some, are there some African, and, and you've been, by the way, one of his other projects that you would want to look at is that Amos has spent considerable time putting together a global systematics that really listens to the voices of other uh, cultures and movements. But a couple of theologians, and then are we following? Are we leading? A little bit of both. Well, thanks again to everybody, and thanks certainly to Karam for, for the invitation. Um, so much to think about. The question about leading or following, um, I think I would actually want to say something like the purpose of what we do as theological educators is to continue to think about and discern what's happening in our churches, right? So it's always a second order activity at, a, at some level. In that respect, I do think the church leads, and yet the leading of the church is subject to all of the all of the the you know of of we as people in that are part of the church, right? And so, what we do in our best efforts to respond to what we feel God is doing in our lives in our context then deserves to be assessed. It deserves to be understood. It deserves to be theologically understood, critiqued, and so on and so forth. So in that respect, I think theological, educa the the theological educators um, are reacting to, responding to, and hopefully in this, again, re reiterative um, you know, relationship or, or reality, uh, what we do can also provide the seeds for ongoing right efforts uh the ongoing 
journey of the church, the churches in, in all of the different contexts to keep experimenting, to keep responding, to keep engaging afresh. Uh, and then the, you know, I think Paul puts it this way, you know, uh, let two or three prophets speak and let the rest of the church judge. That doesn't mean the prophecies are ended. Two or three more prophets will speak the next day and the church will have to judge the next day and, and on and on it goes. Right. So I think that's the journey that we're on. Um, Global theological theologians. Wow. Um, check out the footnotes to my books, folks. Thanks. <laughs> That's a great way to end.